It is not perfect to understand wujud only in terms of oneness or unity as is commonly understood in Wahdatul Wujud. Ibn Arabi himself always insists that the existence of the many is real, as we see in the cosmos, although in the system of mystical philosophy of Ibn Arabi, there is one wujud that is the wujud of Al-Haq. In fact, Al-Haq is manifest in many forms in the cosmos. Then what does it mean if the one is the many and the many are none other than the one? Then again, coincidentia oppositorum in Ibn Arabi's metaphysical view becomes a philosophical principle to understand the relationship between the many and the one. In addition to the fact that Ibn Arabi often emphasizes the unity of being, as a matter of fact, Ibn Arabi also often discusses multiplicity or the many to explain the one, and vice versa talks about the one to explain the many. Although Ibn Arabi ascribes wujud to al-haq, the one, in this case, Ibn Arabi doesn't only speak of wujud as one, but also as many at once, al-wahid al-kathir. Thus, two strikingly opposite natures the one and the many must be understood if one wants to perfectly comprehend al-haq or god. So al-haq is only possible to understand if the two opposite natures are synthesized in one's mystical vision. In simple terms, wujud is one which is many and many which are one. As in the case of the outward and the inward which we have discussed, the true knowledge of wujud is enabled by apprehending the one in the many and at the same time the many in the one, or rather apprehending the one as the many and the many as the one. Of course, this makes one bewildered to be able to perceive Al-Haq in such a way because the empirical word shrouds his vision, so that one doesn't arrive at the true knowledge that God is the one in the many and simultaneously the many in the one. We should meticulously scrutinize how Ibn Arabi describes this seemingly intricate ontological relation. Ibn Arabi very interestingly explains this relation by a mathematical analogy. Let's quote his rather lengthy statements. Numbers arise or derive a serial form by the repetition of one. One brings into existence the number, while the numbers divide or spread the one. A number exists as a number because of something which is counted or enumerated. Numbers may be existent in the empirical word and non-existent in the intellectual word because something counted is non-existent sensually but existent intellectually. Therefore, there must be both numbers and the thing counted just as there must be one which causes all this and is caused by it. Thus, each number is a self-subsistent unity and not a mere conglomeration. And yet, on the other hand, there certainly is a respect in which it must be regarded as once put together. Thus, two is one reality, though it is a gathering of one and one. Three is one reality as well, though a gathering of one and one and one, and so on. However far we go up the numerical series, because each number is one with an independent reality, the essence of each number is not the same as the essences of other numbers. Thus, the fact of gathering of ones is common to all of them. It is as a genus, as it were, which comprises all the species. Hence, we admit the uniqueness of each number different from other numbers in terms of the very essence of each number. And at the same time, we recognize that they are all one. So by saying that all numbers are one reality, one must also say that the one is not numbers. Put simply, the one in the mathematical aspect is the only source of all numbers. And all numbers are nothing but various forms of the manifestation of the one. Even though constituting a number or numbers, one itself, according to Ibn Arabi, is not a number. Each number is a unique reality different from the reality of other numbers. However, each number is a gathering of one and one, or jamul ahad. In addition to one being the source of all numbers, each number must depend on something which is counted. The numbers deriving from the one are intelligible realities, which only exist in the mind, not in the visible world, as long as they do not refer to empirical objects which are counted. So, as an analogy of the two stages of the tajalli of al-haq, or the self-manifestation of God, the numbers which are intelligible realities only exist in the mind and don't exist in the visible world refer to permanent entities which also don't exist in the visible world it has divine names while the numbers counted that appear in the visible world 
refer to the tachali of God in the cosmos, which is none other than our being manifest in concrete forms. It is important to note that both the things counted existing in the visible world caused by the holy emanations and numbers existing in the unseen world as intelligible realities or permanent entities caused by the most holy emanation are the self-manifestation of Al-Haq. Still regarding the self-manifestation of Al-Haq, one of Ibn Arabi's commentators, Al-Qashani, expounds this ontological issue in mathematical aspects in more detail as follows. When one manifests itself in different forms, it is called two. However, two is not something different from one and one put together, whereas one itself is not a number. It should be noted that the structure of this putting together of two ones is one, and the product of this putting together, which is called two, is also one number. So the essential form here is one, the matter is also one, and the two ones put together is also one. It is one manifesting itself in the form of the many. Therefore, one produces the number two by manifesting itself in two different forms. The same is true of three, for example, which is one, one, and one. The structure and nature of its oneness is exactly the same as the case of two. In summary, each number becomes a particular form when one manifests itself by virtue of its unique determination and the rank it occupies in the numerical series. Ontologically, Ibn Arabi analogizes the infinite tachali of Al-Haq in the cosmos to one as a number giving rise to infinite numbers. So we see that there is an equation that the one in the ontological aspects is the source of the diversity of all things as the one in the mathematical aspects is the source of all numbers. In both the ontological and mathematical aspects, the many are nothing but the one, and the many can ultimately be perceived as the one, and vice versa. The fact that in the mathematical aspect, the one can continuously produce numbers shows that in the ontological aspect, the one constantly manifests himself, as we already know that the Tajali is continuous, uninterrupted, and perpetual. But the question is, in what? does he manifest himself? So the answer is numbers cannot appear except in something which is counted or in other words, numbers must refer to something which is counted. Then, Tachali of Al-Haq, the one, cannot appear except in the external word or the visible word. So very simply, we are asked to get back to basic principle of Ibn Arabi's teaching. Everything that exists is the self-manifestation of Al-Haq. Up to this point, knowledge of the nature of numbers in the mathematical aspect has helped us comprehend the true knowledge of the ontological relation between Al-Haq and Al-Khulq, or creation, between the one and the many. Accordingly, we can conclude that Al-Haq and Al-Khulq are one wujud, and all of those are both the one and the many simultaneously, as Ibn Arabi himself asserts. For those who already know what I have explained regarding the numbers, namely that the negation of them is at the same time the affirmation of them, must know that Al-Haq in his incomparability is Al-Khulq, creation in his similarity. Even though Al-Khulq, creation, is clearly distinct from Al-Haq, the creator. In truth, the matter is that we see here the creator who is the creation, Al-Khulqul Makhluk, and the creation who is the creator, Al-Makhluqul Khalik. All this arises from one essence, yet it is one and many at the same time. Regarding the many and the one, Ibn Arabi cautions that one should not fall into just one aspect. He recommends that one should attain the true and perfect knowledge. So we should not apprehend it as either or, but both and. Another of Ibn Arabi's commentators, al qaisari states, O people who follow the path of Al-Haq, contemplate what you see about the one and the many comprehensively. If you only see the one, surely you are with Al-Haq as the only one because of the vanishing of duality. If you only see the many, surely you are with creatures. If you see the one hidden in the many and you see the many vanishing in the one, you'll surely unite the two perfections and be happy with the station of the two virtues. Still concerning the one and the many, let's hit another analogy of Ibn Arabi, which is simpler than the previous mathematical one. Quotes, it is well known that Zaid, a man, is one personal reality, but his hand is neither his foot, nor his head, nor his eye, nor his eyebrow. So he is many and one, many in the forms and one in his person. In the same way, no doubt, man is essentially one. We do know that Amr is not the same as Zaid, no Khalid, no Ja'far, and the individual examples of which are infinitely many. 
Hence, in essence, man is one, while in regard to the forms, bodily members of a particular man, in regard to the individual examples, he is many. From the analogy presented by Ibn Arabi just now, it becomes clearer that the relation between the one and the many is like the relation between us and our bodily members. Although I have many forms of bodily members, I'm still one, in essence in person. This means that the multiplicity of my forms doesn't invalidate the oneness of my essence. Regarding the second analogy, I am human and you are also a human. We are one as human in our universality, but we are many and diverse in our particularity and uniqueness. I am not you and you are not her. This analogy leads us to understand the one and the many more clearly. Al-Haq as the one is Al-Khulq as the many on the one hand, and at the same time Al-Haq as the one is not Al-Khulq as the many on the other. Undeniably, the complexity of the relationship between the one and the many makes one perplexed. According to Ibn Arabi, the perplexity arises because the mind of human is polarized, one towards the one, the other towards the many, both of which we should apprehend as a one thing. Thank you so much for watching, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notification because I can't wait to see you soon.